Hello, it's Wednesday. My name is Mikhail Tinubu. Welcome to Plus Sports and Plus TV Africa. Of course, um, the Nigerian Super Eagles possibly shocked a lot of people as well as the Egyptians yesterday. We'll talk about that as well as other stories in sports news. Thank you for joining us on this uh, most interesting of occasions. I have uh, with me Sheung uh, uh, Ajidagba. Sheung. Good morning, Nick. Congratulations to Nigeria. Yes, it's been, it's been really something. Um, so let's get started. Nigeria's Super Eagles defeated Egypt's Pharaohs 1-0 in their group stage opening match at the ongoing 33rd Africa Cup of Nations in Garoa, uh, Cameroon on Tuesday. Nigeria's win shattered Egypt's unbeaten record at the AFCON as the Pharaohs had gone undefeated in their last 16 group matches. Egypt's last loss in the group stage came in the 2004 tournament when they were defeated 2-1 by Algeria. With an assist from Taiwa Wani, Kelechi and Nacho scored the game's only goal in the 30, 30th minute. Egypt's nightmare night began with a horrible first half for Alali's left back Akram El Grassi, who injured his lower limb while attempting dis to disarm the swift left wing sniper Moses Simon uh, and had to be substituted. Nigeria's left wing was clearly the most fruitful, with the FC Nantes player Moses proven decisive to create the opportunity that led to Kelechi and Nacho's goal. Uh, Augustin Iguavon's side were true to the wing play approach he wants to play, and the team showed a greater threat on the counter than their opponents, as Egypt failed to create enough chances for their talisman, Mo Salah. You know, um, Sheung, I didn't know what to expect going into this match, but watching it, uh, even though there was only one goal in it, Nigeria proved themselves and showed what we should be expecting from them on a regular basis. They were completely the better side in the game. Mikhail, I must say this morning, he was an interim coach, giving an interim president a perfect farewell. Mm -hmm. And what do I mean? When Chief Ernest Chonekon, of blessed memory, passed on yesterday, he was an interim president. A government is an interim manager. So he was interim to interim. Hmm. That was on the flip side. But come to the real action. We never saw it coming. Hmm. We felt a perfect result for Nigeria would have been a draw based on things that surrounded our preparation. Hmm. From sacking of manager to allowing the technical advisor of the Nigerian Football Federation to step in. We draw out of players, Odion Judy Gallo, Toshime, Paul Onoachu, you know, Ogene Kare Tebo. You know, so everything was looking like 13 debutants playing against Egypt, who are a formidable side and the most successful as far as the African conversation is concerned. Yes, yeah, seven With wins. With seven titles. Hmm. But the guys showed up that they can play football. From start to finish, it was a comprehensive performance. Mm. All we just missed was profligacy in front of goal. If Moses Simon had been more clinical and more direct, what we are saying now should have been a different result. You know, but give uh, credit um, of the manager and give credit to the way the defense were disciplined. From Kenneth Omeru mm. to William Trustekom yes, to Zaidu Sanusi. They certainly kept who did a fantastic Mo Salah job. Of quiet. Lino, yes. It was fantastic. You know, okay, questions are already being raised given this performance, even though uh, to me it sounds premature. Whether Augustin Eguavon shouldn't actually just be given the uh, role on a permanent basis, no need for a foreign coach to step in. Unfortunately, there's nothing we can do again. Mm. We have appointed Jose Pesero, and he was in the stand yesterday, and he will take over immediately after the uh, African Cup of Nations. But Mikael, the guy showed God yesterday. Joe Aribo, who mm. said in DT, that we are only, and the NHL rolling back the years. Mm. Even Sadi Kumar came on. You saw what Chidera uh, UK also did when he came on. Mm. So, what I saw yesterday 
was a team that was ready to fight for their place. A team that wanted to show the coach that in the absence of those usual suspects, we can also strut our stock. Mm. The first real attack of the Egyptians came in the 70th minute. That faint shot of Pamesana that the goalkeeper, Maduka Okre, dealt with. But you have to say, they shot out the light of Eneni, uh, Ahmed Egazi, Trezege, even Mohamed Salah, Uma Mamush. Carlos Kuros was clueless yesterday. He never knew what he did. You know, comprehensive performance going, and credit to the boys. Going into this game, the Egyptian media, the uh, Nigerian media, and even world media was expecting this to be a story of one Moses, namely Mo Salah coming in and proving his mettle, bringing all that quality he has shown in the Premier League. But it took a different Moses to part the Red Sea. I think Simon Moses hey. was the main man for the match. Liverpool released Ophel Salah, not Mo Salah. Mm. Mo Salah is still in Liverpool. The one that was brought yesterday <laughs> was the one that Nigeria had for dinner. Uh, it was it was a tepid performance from them. Mm. Salah did not do anything. But the Simon was uh, the one who crossed the Red Sea. Across it in a fantastic fashion. Hello. Sean. I can tell you. Oh, please, go on. No, so I, I said uh, it was Moti Simon mm. that crossed the Red Sea. Yes. Mosala did not really do anything yesterday. And um, what did you think? It felt to me like we were seeing uh, a resurgence of a Nigeria of the 90s. The way they attacked from the wings and stretched the opposition as much as possible. And luckily for us, we had the quality talent in Simon Moses as well as uh, uh, Chukweze. You, you, you know, Chukweze did not really show the Chukweze that we know. Yes, but um, we saw glimpses, though. Performance. Mm. But based on the question you asked, don't forget that when this camp opens on the 29th of December, the coach said something very instructive, that we hope to return to those days of mm. wing plays, mm. that he knows we don't have the ammunition of this world, who coincidentally visited the guys on the eve of the match, you don't have the finity judge, but you can still work on the guys who like to play as inverted wingers. Mm. And I'm talking about the Chukweze, the Simons, mm. who will not cross, but they want to just cut into the box. But the wing play was effective. But like I said, it can be better. All right. Um, obviously, we're still delirious with joy. Uh, we look forward to seeing more from Nigeria in the African Cup of Nations. Now moving to England where um, the COVID-19 continues to be a problem for clubs as they try to maneuver their way through fixtures lists. Chelsea coach Thomas Tuchel has declared his support for clubs being transparent with their struggles with COVID in their requests for match postponements. Regardless of the uh, issues they're facing in England and even in some parts of uh, Europe, um, of course, England, the English Premier League and uh, EFL seems to be taking the brunt of it. Games have had to be rescheduled and even uh, Everton's game last night was also rescheduled again, dealing with uh, the COVID uh, concerns in camp. How far do you think these clubs are going to be pushed to the limits due to this current climate? Well, uh, I must be frank with you. Prior to the start of the African Cup of Nations, there was an issue that uh, CAF were giving a knock on the head by some of the teams. Because CAF said, irrespective of the COVID issue that is plaguing anything, the game will still go ahead. Mm. That even if you have a goalkeeper that is plagued with COVID, what they will do is to use an outfit player. The team is really serious and is hitting them hard in Europe. It, so seem, it seems though that um, CAF is completely out of step with the rest of Europe in trying to preserve the, uh, uh, the fitness levels as well as the general health of these uh, 
footballers. And that can be really detrimental to the eventual uh, positions of these uh, clubs come the end of the season, don't you think? I agree with you. Hmm. And that was why some of those countries were very needed with cap. Hmm. Especially Burkina Faso, opening game against Cameroon. That some of their players tested positive for Corona. And Cap said, as long as you have 11 players, the game will go ahead as planned. That if all your three goalkeepers test positive for Corona, and now this player will get into the goal pool. So these countries see as intensity on the part of Cap. But, but um, with, the current, with the current English, uh, the current British uh, policy on um, confinement, isolation, and COVID protocols that are currently in place that seem even more stringent than the last few months. English teams are bound to suffer another month of uncertainty with these players returning from uh, the AFCON, right? I agree. It, it, it's going to be very difficult mm. uh, because of uh, the problems that they are facing. By the time you recover from COVID, you still have to recuperate. So it's taking a toll on some of these teams. But what you'll be telling them is that how many players did you register? You have close to 40 players, mm. so you can still feel them. But honestly speaking, every country, every club want to have their best hand. So it, it, it's going to be difficult. It doesn't surprise that, me then sure that, that he, Dennis was kept back by Watford, given their current circumstances. Definitely. Mm. Definitely. It, 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 it's, a, it's a pandemic that has ravaged the whole world mm. in the last two, three years. And the players and the coaches and the officials have been at the receiving end. Uh, so some of these clubs, some of these countries are not happy with what's presently happening, mm. but their hands are tied. Even mm. when the English Premier League coaches mm. had a meeting with the organizers, they turned their ears to them and let the game go on. Yeah. You don't want to have backlog of uh, games. Unfortunately, of unfortunately for Chelsea and Liverpool, the current uh, uh, teams, contesting with Manchester City for the league title. Manchester City don't have a lot of players off at AFCON and they're not suffering any significant COVID-19 uh, outs. But uh, let's move to Spain, where Barcelona and Real Madrid finalized training preparations on the eve of uh, the El Clasico match January 11th uh, for their Super, Spanish Super Cup semi-final in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. Earlier, Real Madrid, uh, Real Madrid manager Carlo Ancelotti uh, lavished praise on his Barcelona counterpart, Xavi. Former Barcelona midfielder Xavi took over at the Camp Nou in November following the sacking of Ronald Koeman, but has struggled to turn the fortunes of the club around with the side sixth in La Liga, 17 points behind leaders Real Madrid. However, Ancelotti was impressed with what he had seen so far from the rookie coach, and predicted a strong second half of the season from their arch rivals. Holders uh, Athletic Bilbao meet Atletico Madrid on Thursday, January 13th, to fight it out for the other spot in Sunday's final. The Spanish Football Federation agreed a three-year deal worth a reported 120 million euros uh, with the Saudi Sports Authority in 2019 to expand the competition and play the game in the Middle East. They staged the competition for the first time two years ago with Real Madrid defeating Atletico in the final, while last year's edition was held in Spain due to the COVID-19 pandemic. How far do you think um, the improvements Xavi has made in the team will reflect during this uh, latest El Clasico uh, meeting? Sure. I quickly want to say here mm. that if it's on the balance of current form, there should be no analysis, mm -mm. so there won't be any paralysis. They are my deal all the way. Mm. But when it comes to classic matches like this, or rivalry, form are usually thrown out of the window, and it comes down to who wants it the most. But you have to give credit to what Carancelotti has done for Real Madrid. Mm. The way he has been able to galvanize the boys. Uh, just last weekend against Valencia, 
uh, Karim Benzema, who has always been a supporter of every player, to Cristiano Ronaldo, to Raul, and all of them, and decided to take the bull by the horn. Scored his 300 and 301 goals. So the guys who have more goals than him in Real Madrid history are people like Ronaldo, Alfredo Di Stefano, Raul Gonzalez. But Karim Benzema is a super player. Mm. And his partnership with Vinicius Junior is working excellently well. Uh, Vinicius has grown in leaps and bounds. Not the Vinicius that we used to call Akuro those days, mm. you know, that would be joking up and down on the field. And Real Madrid have once again shown that they can move on with anybody. Uh, yes, so do they don't have Ramos anymore. Mm. They've got uh, their Militao. Uh, they've got no Varane. But the other guys, uh, David Alaba, uh, Tony Cruz, Casemiro, Luka Modric, are not showing any sign of their old. So it's certainly quite impressive football. in offense where Benzema is obviously their greatest asset. But um, oftentimes we see him drop to the left, drop to the right, drop to the midfield. He's still very much all over the pitch, even as though he was still playing second fiddle to a different striker like Ronaldo. Uh, but he's still getting the goals. Meanwhile, Vinicius has come leaps and bounds in his development at getting goals for the team. But the, on the right-hand side, um, Ancelotti is having to contend with uh, a Hazard who isn't quite back to the Hazard of old. Bale who just can't find his way back from injury. Um, um, Asensio who has ta uh, tapered off in recent years, but is having a better season than he has in the last two. Um, and, of course, Rodrigo. But Rodrigo is not on the same level as Vinicius. So their weakest side is on the right, yet they're getting as many goals as they are. One would say you shut out Karim Benzema and Vinicius Jr. You have tamed Real Madrid. Is that even possible? But, but even if you do that, some of these guys come up big. Hmm. The likes of Casemiro... The likes of uh, Tony Cruz, Luka Modric is old, but he's playing like a young person. So they are, they are playing some fantastic football. Honestly speaking, I can't look beyond Real Madrid. No disrespect to Barcelona. I know this is like an El Clasico, but you have to look at Barcelona, that they've been having what we call a lopsided performance, topsy-topsy performance. You know, you see them do well today, they don't do well tomorrow. And I, I, I begin to ask myself, who gets the goals for them? Are they lying on Memphis Depay? Are, are they lying on Gabi? Are they lying on Luke De Jong? Uh, Sergi Buske? You know, so where will he come from? But like I said, when it comes to Derby, form are thrown out of the window. But on the balance of play, you cannot look beyond Real Madrid. And I say Real Madrid all the way. Thank I you, Sean. on the chopping board. Thank you so much, Sean, for joining me today. Uh, always a pleasure having you because um, obviously uh, the knowledge in sports never stops. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to have you on for some cricket very soon. Definitely I should be around to talk about cricket. The reopening of the Tapa Baliwa has been confirmed. Mm. It's coming up this Sunday. So I should join you guys live in the studio by God's grace. We welcome your presence. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. You're welcome. Yeah, same here. Tennis star Novak Djokovic released a long statement on Wednesday, January 12th, with details, details on why he was not in isolation after testing positive for COVID-19 in December and saying his agent made a mistake in feeling out his Australian travel declaration. I want to emphasize that I have tried very hard to ensure the safety of everyone and my compliance with testing obligations, Djokovic said in a statement on his Instagram account. Amid questions about his Australian travel declaration where he had to, where he had to state whether he had traveled within 14 days of coming to Australia, he said his agent accidentally ticked the wrong box on the form. 
The statement came as Australia's Immigration Minister Alex Hawke was considering whether to cancel the world number one tennis player's visa ahead of the Australian Open, which starts on January 17th, amid controversy over whether he was eligible for a medical exemption from the country's COVID-19 vaccination uh, requirements. Meanwhile, staff at Melbourne Park today, January 12th, continue to prepare for the start of the Australian Open. Now, obviously, we hope Djokovic gets to play, but even if he doesn't, it would still will be a memorable competition. That's all we have for you this morning. Join us next time. My name is Mikhail Tinubu. Have a wonderful day. And remember, life is never boring with some sports.